I've been playing Unicorn Overlord because you have no time to game. Welcome to my next When the Credits Roll series, a series in which I only review a game once I've seen the credits roll. The game in this case is Unicorn Overlord, which came out March 8th, 2024, was developed by Vanillaware, published by Sega for the Nintendo Switch, PS4, PS5, and Xbox Series X. And it took me roughly, I say roughly, playtime was 33 hours and 22 minutes. Um, but I believe a lot of people go a lot longer on it. And if you want to do all of the side content, you're looking maybe 100 plus hours if you really get into it. I can see people dropping that sort of time. But anyway, Unicorn Overlord, it kind of came out of nowhere. It's a very interesting strategy RPG. Now, in this channel, I review a lot of like turn-based tactical RPGs. And this is not that, because it's not turn-based. It's um, more like Deerfield Chronicles, but not as in it's uh, real-time, real-time strategy. Uh, done in a gorgeous art style. Uh, gotta get that there, because I don't usually talk about art styles in games, but this game just lives up to Vanillaware's history of amazing art. Uh, they really went all out on it, and it looks fantastic. But anyway, what is a Unicorn Overlord? It's not just a game with a very interesting name, and I must admit, I'm impressed with how they actually worked in such a strange name as Unicorn Overlord into the story and not make it seem cheesy. Because, let's, let's admit, Unicorn Overlord is a bit of a cheesy, odd name. But anyway, what do we have? Well, we've got a continent at war. Or, it should say, at the end of a war. The evil empire has basically won. I mean, they they took the first country and then conquered the rest. There was once this general of a country called Cornia. His name was Valmore. Um, he led a rebellion, overthrew the queen, and renamed himself and founded an ancient empire. And then very quickly, I say quickly, 10 years, conquered pretty much the known world. But, the start of his rebellion, we have a young prince being ushered away by a paladin of, in front of the queen, just as she is setting out to face this rebel tyrant. This young prince disappears, and over the ten years is raised by this paladin to be a noble hero, a leader of men. And, well... After this 10 years of him waiting and learning and training, he steps onto the stage because of reasons. And thus begins the rise of Prince Elaine and his rebellion against the Zenorian Empire. If I'm honest, the story in Unicorn Overlord, by about 10, 15 hours into the game, didn't, didn't really care. It's very tropey. A lot of it, there's a lot of characters, and a lot of them just live up to an archetype or a stereotype. Um, it, obviously, when you have games of this size with this many characters, not every character is going to get a full background history. I mean, it does have like an appendix type thing where you can go in and read more about all the characters, but not every character is well developed. But yeah, it, it, it felt like a very generic story. It's serviceable. Don't get me wrong, it's not terrible. There's a difference between not being great and being bad. And it's not bad. It carried me through the game. But it's not the best story I've ever seen in a game. Is that a bad thing? If I'm honest. In this case, no. In If I was playing a more st story-driven RPG, then... Uh, I'd be yes, but this game, you can get away with it because it's it's all about the gameplay in this game. Um, the story is just incidental. It's just there. It's a reason. <laughs> Nothing more <laughs> to me anyway. So, what do, what do we have gameplay-wise? Well, 
as with many games, we have the classic, there's an overworld. This game has a world map. I was not expecting that. And then obviously you have the battle scenes. But we'll talk about the world map bit first. So it's quite big. Surprisingly big. And with several distinct areas that all have their own story section. That all have their own unique happenings going on. Um, are distinct and make sense why they're distinct from all the other places um, yeah it's it's surprisingly vast uh, I didn't expect it going in because I didn't play the demos or anything like that to not colour my opinions on the world map there's actually quite a bit to do so you're a rebellion trying to bring down an empire so you've got to lead the rebellion to take forts and towns and stuff like that and they're scattered all across the map and usually when you get near one of these you'll see the enemies on the map enemies can run into you on the map and then you do like a little battle to see if you get knocked back out of the area or you can just carry on and wipe them out um but when you get near a town it starts like a liberation quest and you can take over the town surrounding area and what's really cool is once you've taken over these towns, in many cases you can then develop them. As in, they give you the options, like the towns have shops in them, which have all unique items. So they all have like a blacksmith and a provisions area. And they all have their own items in there. And then you can develop it by using items you find on the map, like, um, like farming spots. And then once you've developed it, you can station one of your men there. And what they do is as you complete other maps and quests and stuff like that they'll farm those local spots for you so you don't have to keep running around the map collecting all the items so you're really encouraged to create a lot of men to station in every town so it just brings in all of the items continually for you other than that there'll be side quests as well um, you come across random people on the map they give you random quests most of these are involve conquering more towns um but there are the chicken quests where you gotta go and capture chickens <laughs> for the people to get a nice reward uh, the side quests usually result in you getting new members of your team um or introducing new like class types so you might come across a griffin knight for the first time and then they join you and then you learn about griffin knights and how they work Beyond that, there's like the Colosseum, which is like a s series of set fights that you can go through. And there's even an on online element to it. I didn't really do that. But the more you fight in there, the more Colosseum coins you gain to spend in its own special shop to get some quite good items. But all of this leads to... Um, a lot of the reason you're doing this is to gain more items to develop your team beyond just buying like weapons and consumables for battles um, you gain like honor for delivering items to the towns you also unlock like um, ports which let you get to new areas and stuff like that but the the honor system is used in the forts so separate to the towns there's forts and in the forts you can higher new troops so each fort has its own set of troop types it can hire you can hire so like mercenaries basically um and you need honor to buy these guys you can also promote your units at a fort which also costs honor um and you can expand your unit size so your units start off with three like you can assign three people to a unit and then eventually you can make it up to five and this takes quite a bit of honor you can also unlock more units that you can take into battle um, and you can get quite a lot by the end so honor is really important and you get it from in some cases from delivering in a lot of cases completing battles obviously honor and gold are a reward for completing battle um, that's normal <laughs> uh, you also get renown from completing battles as well um, renown is quite important for the world map as it as your renown goes up it's like another measure of how well you're known in the world as your renown goes up it lets you unlock the ability to expand your units from three to four to five 
so that's quite important to make sure you get your own own up but yeah there's there's a lot going on just on the world map and you'll be running around it quite a lot experiencing things looking for things um doing all the little bits and pieces so something i just forgot is the another type of battle that it unlocks once you collect this shaman lady it unlocks these like repeatable battles on the map um it's important to obviously complete each one at least once because you get a special reward but they are a repeatable battle which is where you can help train up new troops and stuff like that so they're quite important and they're scattered all over and they get harder and harder as you go but all of this is leading up to obviously building our teams as you've heard me say we start with units of three so what do i mean by that so it's not like a fire emblem or anything like that where you have one guy and another guy and another guy you're taking in teams very much like ogre battles or symphony of war which came out recently you build a team of distinct units um it's on a, a three by two grid you set them up how you want like you choose your up to five put them into the grid and then you equip them so each character can have a weapon many of them have shields and then at least two accessories the guys that don't have shields have a third accessory the amount of variety in creating a character is absolutely incredible so each character has a class obviously as they level up they gain class skills beyond that many weapons many shields many accessories also come with skills or they might just have straight staff buffs you then get a, like a list of tactics for each character and you can lay them out there's like attack ones and like passive ones passive skills and there's a lot of options there like you can put in a lot of tactics you can repeat the same tactic several times so every character has a like ap which is attack points and pp which is like passive points how many they can use in a battle in a turn and you can define in the tactics section exactly how the skills are used so you might set an attack at the highest level and then that will only be used specifically if there is a cavalry enemy because it's strong against cavalry that's then you might have another attack that specifically targets armored opponents etc and you can like each one has like two levels of like ai control in it so you can set really specific conditions for when that skill activates and you can not use skills you can use certain skills you can use skills multiple times so you can really get into the nitty-gritty of defining your character and this is where you're going to spend a lot of time like for those of the people that are going to put 100 hours into it it's going to be because they're playing around with this to the nth degree to fine-tune their teams to an incredible level and it's really good and it's actually surprisingly fun to fiddle around with it all but okay so now we've created our characters we've run around the world map and we've gone into a battle what happens well if i'm honest most battles first you have a victory condition and a defeat condition usually nine times out of ten this is take the enemy's base or lose your own base they, those are your victory and defeat conditions there are quests that have either like middle things like first take these four places this will unlock the fifth place for you to go take make sure this unit doesn't die etc but it usually boils down to don't lose your base take the enemy base so what you do is you'll see your little flag that's your base to start with you can have valor points um you start usually with like three or four uh, you can spend a valor point to deploy a unit so you'll deploy your units and then from there you will set them on a path like you can select a unit and get them to move use an item on them whatever they have each unit has a number of actions so it's like a number of battles they can do before they become exhausted so you'll send them out they'll start walking off this is all real time 
so while you're setting this up you can pause it it does pause a lot for you to do things but the enemy is is working against you they'll be spawning new units they'll be coming towards you to try and take your base so there's not a rush because it does pause but you can miss things if you're focused in one area so you send your guys out and then they bump into another enemy that's when a battle starts so this is when you get to watch out how the tactics you defined play out and you get to by watching it you'll see how well your units are working um, do they have any strengths and weaknesses because every class type of which there are many there are many many classes in this game many of which can be promoted as well and all of them have strengths and weaknesses and you get to see how this works does your unit work against this unit and does it win the turn plays out whoever loses the most hp loses and usually gets knocked back unless they've taken a place um if you're the winner and you've killed them outright they disappear if they survived but they lost they get knocked back and then your unit the winning unit will tend to run at them again um from there after you there will be like watchtowers like fortresses towns and all sorts that you can take on the way these usually give you like the towns and fortresses that you take give you a new point where you can deploy new units from obviously as you're beating troops you're gaining more valor as you're battling you gain more valor as well and this allow you to deploy more of your troops like i said you can bring quite a lot and then in many battles like side quests and stuff like that you'll have other extensions you can do even do tricky things like go into a town withdraw and then spawn them in another town if they're in the wrong part of the map like your units in the wrong part of the map from where you want it it's quite a lot again of tactical flexibility just in the gameplay because you've got to think about what's your unit strong against what they weak against is it good to send that unit over that way then there are like traps in the map of which you can deploy your own so things like bombs uh fortification and stuff like that that are on over all over the map so you've got to be careful where your troops are moving flying units can fly over these all sorts there's just so much variety in movement and characters and everything especially when you add in like i said flying units like griffin knight wyverns knights you got loads of cavalry units loads of infantry units yeah but to add on to this on the map as well there's also siege weapons like catapults and battering rams and crossbows and you can claim these and use them against the enemies as they'll use them against you so you have to be careful because they have quite a range on them in a lot of cases there's also shrines shrines allow you to use magic like some attacking magics or healing magics and some of them even interact with the environment in some ways for special missions characters um, as i mentioned previously there's there's valor that's what you use to deploy units but it can be used in another way as well every unit has like a feat special attack type thing that you can spend when they're not in battle so you use the valor to do things like summon mercenaries onto the field which is very powered because the mercenaries you summon are matched to the level of the mission not the level of the character summoning it so if you're a level 5 unit in a level 40 mission the mercenaries will be level 40 um, there's things like healing abilities obviously resurrection and stuff like that um, and things like heavy swing which destroys the aforementioned like barricades and mines and stuff like that so you can get rid of the environmental effects and even more <laughs> we have um assists so depending on the hero that's the leader of the unit they have an extra ability so a magic person like a magic attacker will if they're in range of someone attacking someone else they'll lend at their attack and do extra damage same with archers and healers 
and if you're in watchtowers this effect is even further so like if you're attacking an enemy base and there's loads of watchtowers with healers and stuff like that around that can really swing the battle against you but if you've got loads of guys on watchtowers around you it swings it in your favor so there's a whole lot of thinking about it add in all the extra items and stuff you can use and then i mentioned it briefly earlier as well as exhaustion so your characters can have a certain number of actions before they become exhausted and then they need to rest this waste a little bit of time every mission has a time limit i think i ran out of time once so it's nothing to be worried about i barely even hit the halfway mark in most missions um but the exhaustion uh they have to rest which takes time and they're quite vulnerable when they're resting or you can use items to quickly speed up that rest but you can up the numbers by taking towns and then sitting in, on the towns like um not only will it hear your characters sitting on a town it will also raise their number of actions again so there's so much to think about so much to do it's a really awesome system all around and i highly recommend it to any sort of tactics fans turn-based tactics fans give it a go you might enjoy it but anyway i always look at like before giving my final thoughts i always like to have a quick look at what the general consensus is usually i go to metacritic for this as the game's not on pc we can't look at steam um so metacritic it's got an 87 and an 8.4 from the users so yeah yeah i i thoroughly agree with this it's it's a really good game as you probably got from my general oh as you probably guessed i i think it's a good game yeah yeah i really i really agree with this it, it's a solid title and it's deserving of that eight nine bracket of scores my final take is obviously you've probably guessed i really enjoyed the game it's really fun it's very deep and complex but as far as you want to go it's not some way you need to go deep into it to complete it you can dip in as far as you as you want to obviously if you want to complete the coliseum and have the best characters possible and stuff like that you need to go really deep into it but you can complete the game and there is even difficulty settings that allow it you to do this like a story mode and easy and stuff like that which make it a lot easier to do and give you more xp so you can dip into it as much as you want obviously as i said the weakest point is probably the story it's only serviceable not terrible not great and that's fine this sort of game always comes to me as it's about the mechanics and the gameplay the story is just a delivery method to get you to play the game so yeah my final rating is must play 